All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to CFO's first birding skills workshop series uh, with Eric Hines. Uh, and I just, uh, this is Nick Komar from uh, the CFO board and we just have a few announcements to make. Uh, one is that we have two more Zoom uh, birding skills workshops scheduled these are going to be monthly workshops, and we, we basically are putting these on because we can't do field trips now. So the next one is going to be February 8th on gull identification, and that will be given by me. And then a month later, on March 28th, Ted Floyd will give a workshop on, on how to use eBird to improve your birding experience, um, mainly geared towards beginners. And... Uh, Registration for these workshops is free. It can be done on the website, cobra.org, or, or um, the same way you did with, with this particular workshop, if you heard about it from a different source. Okay, next slide, please. There's a couple other uh, Colorado Field Ornithologist, Ornithologist events coming up, but we just want you to save the date. On March 28th, we'll have our next speaker series, our quarterly speaker series with Arvind Punjabi of the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And he will be talking about conserving grassland birds in Northern Mexico. Uh, and then on May 8th, uh, save the date for our inaugural Colorado Birding Challenge. Uh, we won't be able to have a convention this year for the second year in a row. So this will be our, our, our major fundraising event. This is a fundraiser for conservation. Uh, and all the money goes to conservation uh, and I will tell you a little bit more about it at the next slide. So it's a, it will be held May 8th, 2021. It's essentially a birdathon to raise money for conservation, for grassland species conservation. Uh, and um, teams of two to four people will select a county of their choice where they will conduct their birdathon. They'll collect all their data using eBird. So it actually, the data contributes to the global eBird big day, which is the same day. And uh, the teams will would, would select a category to compete, uh, either automobile or green, which is non-motorized like bicycle uh, or youth category or photo audio category. There'll be prizes for each of those, the winners of each of those categories. Uh, the winner is the team with the, the, the score the highest score, which is determined by their big day total divided by a county handicap. So we're using a PAR system so that all counties are created equal, even if they are not actually equal in terms of bird diversity. Uh, even working in a low diversity county, you can still win the competition. So we'll be raising uh, money uh, through donations or per species pledges, and even individuals can participate, even if they're not part of the team. So we encourage everybody in, in Colorado to participate and make this inaugural event a, a huge success. Uh, there's no fee to register for CFO members, and non-members can register for a $50 fee, or they can join CFO for $25 next. Hmm. So... Uh, in general, the, the number of people that the Colorado Field Ornithologists serve is much greater than the number of members that we have. So we're encouraging people to actually join, the, join our organization. So for just $25 a year, uh, you'll earn a subscription to Colorado Birds, our journal, um, but also discounted fees for annual conventions, uh, early sign-up opportunities for convention field trips, access to CFO quarterly field trips, discounted membership to Western Field Ornithologists, our partner organization, and much, much more that CFO provides to its members. So we hope that you will decide to join uh, through cobirds.org. Okay, uh, and with that, we can go forward with the presentation tonight. And so I will introduce Eric Hines. Uh, Eric is a well-known birder a, a professional field guide for Field Guides Inc. And he uh, also has his own birding company called Box Canyon Birding. He lives in Telluride, Colorado and has for the last six years. We're very happy to have Eric living in Colorado with us. And um, he grew up in New England and uh, 
practice his raptor identification skills as a as a uh, data recorder at at um, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, where where they they monitor hawk migration, and he also worked for several seasons uh, in on western raptors at the Snake is it Snake River uh, Raptor Research Center or Snake Canyon? I think. Okay, Eric, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Nick. Well, good evening. Eric, you're muted. Hold on. I'm going to unmute. How about now? Are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so now you can, be, okay. you can hear. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, muted. So, good evening, everyone. I'm terribly excited to see 200 people um, paying attention to Raptors this evening. This is uh, really exciting in this challenging time of a pandemic. Um, I'm sure a lot of us feel pretty isolated. So, it's fun to know there are 200 people out there. I'm excited about birds this evening, so hopefully I'll, I'll make it worth your while. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about raptor identification and specifically um, trying to whittle it down a little bit to not be totally overwhelming. We're going to talk about what you can expect to see on a regular basis here in Colorado in the wintertime. So obviously we've got the national symbol, the adult bald eagle, to uh, kick things off here. Um, so as Nick said, yes, I'm a lifelong passionate person um, about birds and birding growing up in New England. Um, and that has sort of evolved into many different roles with bird research and education. Um, and now most recently focusing on guiding. I've worked for field guides since 2012, taking people bird watching all over the world, um, which is not a very pandemic friendly vocation. So I'm trying to do a little bit more locally and started Box Canyon Birding so you can Check me out there. That's a website uh, placeholder at this point. I'm building one. So but let's um, get right into it. So, what is a raptor? A raptor, um, the word raptor comes from rapier, R A P E R E, which is uh, a word in Latin, which means to seize, to grab, to snatch, to take away. Raptors are predators. These are birds of prey. Um, and some characteristics that unite raptors around the world are these incredible powerful feet with sharp talons. So I'll use my cursor here to point things out. But if you see, here's an osprey, which is something we won't see in Colorado in the wintertime. So but what this osprey exhibits that all birds of prey exhibit, powerful feet for grabbing its prey, long, sharp talons, um, exceptional eyesight. They have wonderful vision and this sharp hooked beak for tearing apart their prey. Um, and so there's incredible diversity, but we're going to focus on the raptors that are diurnal. Um, not, I'm not going to get into owls today. We're talking about raptors in Colorado. Um, and how, this is basically how I like to bird and how I recommend birding. And, and this applies to not just raptors, but birding in general. Um, something you want to think about when you're out in the field is forget the feathers. I know that makes a little bit of probably is confusing. My point being, oftentimes birders will focus on the plumage first. Um, if you're looking at a northern cardinal, that makes some sense if you see a brilliant red bird. But in general, um, to quickly get to an identification of a raptor, you really want to focus more on, and it's summarized in several different terms. Some people like to use the German word gestalt, which basically means um, that whatever is something is it is actually greater than the sum of its parts. Um, so looking at all the pieces put together and creating something grander than that. Or some people like to reference um, GISS, GIS, which references a general impression of size and shape. Some people credit that to World War II and fighter pilots. Some have debunked that, but it doesn't really matter the origin, but that's talking about proportions and general impression of size and shape. Another term which predates perhaps um, is jizz, which has been credited to the 1920s and an Irishman, which basically is a term referring to the energy or the spirit of something. And so we're looking at this collective whole. And so I really want you to think about is the structure. And some of you might be wondering, what is this bird? I thought we were talking about Colorado raptors. Um, this is a California condor. 
which um, I think should be on everyone's radar. They are incredible um, at soaring and traveling great distances, but they're also a wonderful example of some structural things to pay attention to. Look how long these wings are. Um, notice the emarginated primaries. Um, we also have this exceptionally, for the bird, compared to the wing length, a short tail, um, squared corners, minimal head projection, and so a quite distinctive bird. Um, here it is in better light. Um, something else just to keep in mind as you're looking at raptors and trying to identify them. Uh, my mentor, when I was a younger, he used to say, bird the bird. Um, don't look at a field guide and look for field marks in the field guide and then try and find them on the bird. Take what the bird is presenting to you. Take the situation, notice the habitat you're in, the surroundings, the behavior. Um, what is the bird giving you and then go from there. Um, and I really want to emphasize proportions and structure as we talk about the different species tonight. Um, so here on the left, you see a red-tailed hawk. This is in the genus Budio. They have long, broad wings. They have a fan-shaped tail that is not exceptionally long. They're wonderful at storing, but look at the structure of that bird. Think of its silhouette compared to the bird on the right, which is a northern harrier with exceptionally long wings that are narrow very long tail, tubular, narrow body. Um, so structurally, these birds are quite different and readily separable just on structure alone. Uh, another good thing to pay attention to when you're looking at raptors is the flight style. Because of the structure of the birds, their wing shape um, greatly impacts how they fly. Here's a just a funny little story. This is a picture I took uh, up at uh, Colbank Pass in San Juan County here in Colorado. And there's a cliff face there that peregrine falcons nest on. And this is a peregrine falcon to the right. And I was watching an osprey soaring through the pass. And little did it know that it was interloping into a peregrine falcon nesting territory and the peregrine took exception to the osprey's presence and came bombing off the cliff and stooped on this osprey mercilessly. But it was really interesting to watch this long-winged soaring osprey struggling to get out of the way of this little fighter jet of a peregrine falcon. So flight style can be a really good clue when you're trying to identify raptors. Um, and here's a little exercise I want you to do. I want you to take your hands and block the big bird in the middle. And then take your hand away and look at that picture again. And maybe put the hand back up. And so what I want to focus on here is size is the great deceiver. We're not great at judging depth perception. So how far away a bird is um, sometimes can be difficult for us. And so these birds look quite similar other than being different size. But this is actually a peregrine falcon, an immature peregrine falcon in the foreground with some very close swallows taking exception to the peregrine. Um, so these are not three falcons together far too far away. Um, these are a peregrine and swall swallow. So just size only is really helpful if you can compare something directly, um, like you have a bird sitting on a stop sign or a mailbox or a fence post or something else. But if you have a bird in the sky, I would be cautious about judging it how big it is. One clue though, for judging how big a bird is in the sky is to pay attention to how it soars in terms of its circling. A small bird circling completes the circle much faster, like a sharp shinned hawk circling compared to a bald eagle. That's a big, slow, long duration to get all the way around. So the speed at which a bird completes a circle while soaring is an indication of the size. So that might help you a little bit, but just be careful with size when you're judging birds. Um, especially when it comes to gender differences. This is a pair of Cooper's hawks that I watched copulate at the uh, west entrance of Colorado National Monuments a couple of years ago. And you can clearly see there is a size difference. With birds of prey, and this holds true no matter what the species, the female is larger than the male. So, and I confirm this, the male on the left had just gotten off the female on the right and they copulated. Um, there are several ideas or theories about why there are size differences between them, but it probably mostly has to do with energetics. Um, if they are a pair and they have a territory and they're trying to raise young, 
and they're both out hunting trying to feed the young. If the male, if they are of different size, they are likely to go after different size prey. So they're not really competing with each other in terms of potential prey items. Um, also, the male being smaller uh, probably goes after smaller prey. And so he is more likely to bring more frequent meals. You know, there are very few moose, but there are lots of mice. Um, so with that principle in mind, smaller prey items are more numerous. And with growing chicks in the nest, if the female is brooding those chicks, the chicks are better off having frequent meals. So there's a couple different theories about it. Um, but notice the size difference between these, um, which only is relevant when it comes to two birds together. Obviously, if this bird, either one of these was on the branch by themselves, size would no longer be helpful. But females are larger than males. Uh, there's also sexual dimorphism when it comes to plumage. There are several species we'll talk about, like Northern Harrier here, where there is conspicuous difference in plumage pattern um, based on gender. The other one that in our area this time of year that is conspicuous is American Kestrel. Um, and as I mentioned, forget the feathers. I really, so thinking about as we go through this, we'll talk about structure and behavior and flight style primarily, but of course we will also talk about plumage. Um, and if you're looking at raptors, I've just listed some of the key differentiating places on a bird's plumage on the body of the bird and the wings and the tail that be, will be helpful trying to determine if you are at that stage where you're looking at plumage. So, um, and one of the things, one of the reasons I mentioned for getting the feathers is it's so variable if you have differences in age, differences in gender, and then time of year with molt. Um, so even though I said we're going to forget the feathers, I'm going to do a quick lap around a bird here just to make sure we're all talking about the same feather tracks so everyone understands what I mean here. So here we've got a red-tailed hawk, an adult red-tailed hawk. And on the wings, you've got flight feathers and coverts. So these flight feathers are, are called remiges, and the outermost flight feathers, these first 10 feathers, are primaries. And then these inner feathers are secondaries. On the wing here, this leading edge is sort of a flexible membrane. If you actually were to sort of bounce your finger on that, it would almost feel like a rubber band. And that's the patagium or patagial area, patagial mark. And so for red-tailed hawks, they have these distinctive dark patagial marks. Out here we have this carpal area. Carpal refers to wrist, like you know, people get carpal tunnel in their wrist. This is the carpal joint here on the bird. Um, and so some people refer to this as like a wrist comma, a wrist or carpal area here. Um, these feathers that look like fingers are amarginated is the term. So you have amarginated primaries. Um, and this comes into play with some raptor identification in terms of how many primaries are amarginated. Uh, onto the tail, we've got these erectrices, a single tail feather is referred to as erectrix. These are the undertail coverts around the feet here, moving up into the vent. Here we have the belly, and now we're up into the chest and the throat. These feathers lining sort of what you think of as the wing pits, these are the axillaries. And this is, in general, we're looking at the underside of a bird, so this is referred to as a ventral view. And now we have a, a, a red-tailed hawk. I can't remember if this is the same red-tailed hawk. Um, but here we have a perched look at a dorsal view, the backside of the bird. And when it's perched, obviously, you know, talking about the beak and on the beak, it gives way to some facial a sort of soft skin. This is known as the sear, C-E-R-E. -E. You can see the nares or nasal opening here on the upper part of the bill. You've got a the bill, here's two parts, the lower part being the mandal, mandible. The upper part is the maxilla. Raptors with their large eyes and their exceptional vision often have a protruding superciliary ridge over this eye to protect it. And so this is the supercilium or eyebrow area here. You have auriculars around the ear and down through the mustachial marks and malar area. Um, this is referred to as the nape. The back of the head is the nape. The top of the head is the crown. And on the upper back here, we have the mantle. And giving the mantle giving way to scapulars, 
descending into tertials, and then we have the wing coverts here, lesser, medium, and greater. And now we're getting in down to the secondary, and these are the primaries, and here's the tail. So did everyone memorize that perfectly, I hope? Nah, just kidding. We'll go over it again, but just wanted to point those out as we talk about it. And when you're thinking about a bird, we're talking about structure, behavior, and everything else, but also there are a lot of other clues about identification. What habitat are you in? Uh, what's the time of the year? What's the weather like? Is it a windy day? Is it a sunny day? Is it overcast? Um, is the bird of prey interacting with other wildlife? Is it chasing a bird? Is it pouncing on a mouse? Um, these are all clues to identification. And uh, I always tell my daughters, nobody's perfect, but practice gets you closer. Just get out there. Um, if you can get to a hawk watch and migration, that's ideal to have lots of repetition, but um, the more time in the field, the better off you are trying to identify these things. All right. And uh, here's just a word of caution. Two birds, they're readily identifiable on perch, but when they're in the sky, often get confused with birds of prey. On the left is a common raven. On the right, a turkey vulture. Common ravens have a very distinctive tail shape, so it's kind of this wedge-shaped or kind of wooden spoon-shaped tail. Um, and uh, so that's a big clue. Obviously, they vocalize a lot. Crows never soar. Ravens readily soar. So you could confuse them with a dark more fracture, but look at this tail shape to really tell. And then also this big, long, heavy bill instead of a hooked bill like raptors have. And of course, the turkey vulture um, soaring with a strong dihedral. Dihedral means the wingtips are held higher than the body, sort of a shallow V shape. And they have this contrasting dark and light, the dark wing linings, dark wing coverts, and then the remiges are all sort of pale, translucent, silvery, if you have them in good light. But here's a good tip away. All hawks, eagles, falcons, and such have a feathered head. Turkey vultures have a naked head. Uh, and so if you can see a naked head, if it's a close bird like this, obviously that gives it away. But what the bigger effect is, if it's a mile away, you just don't even see that head. You can't really make it out. So if it, it's a large soaring bird that appears headless, it's probably a turkey vulture. All right, so we're going to launch into the first species. We're going to start with a very distinctive one, one I like to refer to as the Gumby of raptors. It's like you took a normal hawk and you just yanked on its wings and you yanked on its tail and you ended up with this really lanky bird. Uh, Northern Harriers are extremely light. They have the best wing loading ratio amongst raptors, meaning the body weight compared to the surface area of the wings and tail. Um, they soar along with a very buoyant, languid flight. Um, and they have a dihedral, which makes them kind of wobble a little bit as they're soaring. And you're always going to see them in more open landscapes like marshes, meadows, agricultural fields, open landscapes. Um, and we'll go through some images obviously now, but I just want to sort of get those structural things in your head as you're looking at these pictures. Now, in, in general, all these photographs are photographs that I took, not necessarily all in Colorado, though most of these I took in Colorado, um, but most of these images are mine. Um, there are a few exceptions where I had to fill in with some friends and I will mention, give them photo credit as we go through. So here's a Northern Harrier. This is what I refer to as, like I said, the Gumby of raptors. It's just really long, thin wings, really long tail, narrow body. Um, so structurally quite distinctive. You know, just look how lanky this bird is. Um, and this is a good clue structure-wise, those really long legs, dangling legs, but also look what it's doing. It's only a foot or two off the ground in an open landscape. Uh, this bird is well built for soaring slowly and trying to find prey items, mostly small mammals, but birds as well on the ground. And they have, similar to owls, they have a facial disc. And you'll see, uh, if you look carefully, actually this next image shows a little bit better. Um, this is a the rusty, beautiful orangish plumage of the previous couple of slides. Let me go back just to emphasize that. Um, these are immature birds. When northern harriers leave the nest, they have this beautiful sort of pumpkin cinnamon blush to the underside. And as they mature, that cinnamon starts to fade. But I want to point out this facial disc. Like owls, northern harriers have a cut facial pattern to the feathering, and that helps funnel sound to their ears. And so as you see harriers coursing low over meadows and fields, they're actually listening for small mammals squeaking, scurrying, uh, as well as looking for them. 
So they, they fly low and slow to be able to listen as well as to look. And as those female immature birds mature, the adult plumage of a northern harrier female is streaky on the breast and it loses that rustiness. Which is in sharp contrast, sexually dimorphic from the adult males referred to as a gray ghost. Uh, these birds, same structure though, if you think about the structure and behavior, still coursing low and slow over an open field, marsh or meadow, the desert landscape. Um, and then a good clue if you see a dorsal view, no matter what age, if it's immature, if it's adult, female, male, they all have this conspicuous white front patch. So it's the basal portion, basal portion or base of the tail feathers as well as onto the rump and those upper tail coverts. So that's a good clue. Uh, but when you're birding with, when you're trying to identify raptors, you want to take a, the totality of clues that you're given and not just key in on one. So I didn't really want to point that out towards it's like a little farther along here. The adult males, the gray ghosts, they have that beautiful gray on the above, and then below they're clean white with inky wingtips. A really striking bird, but again, habitat clue. It's over an open landscape, coursing low, and it's got really long, thin wings and a long tail. So there's Northern Harrier for you. Uh, perch, they're also just as distinctive. They're just a really long, lanky bird. But you not that often that you see harriers perched. All right, we're going to jump into another fairly easy category here. We're going to talk about eagles now, the tanks. These giant, uh, massive, heavy bodied, large raptors. Now we've got two here in Colorado. We've got the bald eagle on the left and the golden eagle on the right. And in adult plumage, obviously, it's pretty conspicuous. But in the immature plumages, which are highly variable, it can be pretty tricky. But in general, the structural things you want to pay attention to, a bald eagle has a more massive head and a heavier bill. They're in two different genuses. They're not that closely related. Uh, bald eagle is in the Halaetus genus. It's the sea eagle, if you will, and um, Acula for the golden eagle. So these are two different, not that closely related birds, but they're both massive. But the golden eagle has just a slightly smaller head proportionally and a smaller bill, and it's longer tailed proportionally. Uh, when you see one soaring, they just look like a two by 12 in the sky, like a big plank. But when bald eagles are soaring, they soar with a very flat wing, and a golden eagle soars with a slight dihedral, a moderate dihedral, so there's a little bit of elevation of the wingtips over the body. Um, if you're seeing one perched, you can see the legs, the lower part of the leg, the tarsi, that meets the foot, on a golden eagle is feathered, on a bald eagle is not. Uh, but it gets tricky when you get into the immature plumages, so we'll spend some time with that. Uh, here we are perched, but pointing out here on the left, the golden eagle, you notice there's feathering all the way down to those massive feet. Whereas this is a juvenile first plumage bald eagle, and it has these bright yellow naked tarsi. So if you can see the feet, that's a good clue, massive bill, and even um, all ages, golden eagles will show those golden hackles, how it got its name, whereas a young bald eagle will not. Um, and a new bald eagle, when it's young, has an all dark bill. And the golden eagle, this exposure is a little goofy. It's kind of hard to tell, but the tip is usually kind of dark and it kind of fades to pale and then it has the yellow sear. Uh, but that feathering all the way down is a good clue if the plumage is given you, is fooling you. When we have a, eagles in flight, um, the immature plumages of bald eagles can be quite confusing and oftentimes an immature bald eagle is misidentified as a golden eagle. But two things structurally you wanna pay attention to is, is looking at the head and the tail. So on a bald eagle on the right there, the head is more massive and the bill is heavy and it projects fairly far in front of the wing. And the tail on a bald eagle is not short, but it's not exceptionally long. So it adds up such that the bald eagle has at least half as much projecting in front of the wings as it does projecting behind the wings. If you look at the bird on the left, you have a golden eagle here, an adult golden eagle. The head and bill are smaller, projecting not too far in front of the wings. And the tail is proportionally quite long, projecting farther behind the bird. 
And so a golden eagle shows a, a silhouette where there is less than half as much in front of the wings as there is behind the wings. And so even on a cloudy day when you just have a silhouette, look for this head to tail ratio. Also notice on the golden eagle, the secondaries have a little bit of a bulge, just more of a rounded trailing edge to the wing compared to a bald eagle, which typically has a straighter trailing edge to the wing. And then as I mentioned earlier, when they're soaring, bald eagles are like a two by 12, a plank in the sky. They're flat as can be, golden eagle soar with a slight dihedral. So getting into the younger birds is where it gets tricky. On the left, again, golden eagle. On the right, bald eagle. And so where's the whites is really if you're judging. But again, start with the head and tail projection, not too much in front of the wing, longer tailed, big, heavy head and bill. Tail's long, but it's not exceptionally long. And this is kind of a goofy angle to judge that. It's not as extreme as looking at the differences here where you have a, where things are sort of even. This is a little bit off set. Um, but golden eagles will always have juvenile plumage, immature plumage, adult, always have a dark body and a dark back and chest and belly. But they will show some white sometimes when they're young and the base, the basal portions are their primaries, the innermost primaries and the outermost secondaries. This is highly variable. Some golden eagle juveniles and immatures show almost none or it's hard to see it. Um, and then here on the tail, the tail of a juvenile golden eagle is clean white with a clean break. So it's white at the basal portion. These are these undertail coverts are tawny in coloration. That's not actually part of the tail. These are the undertail coverts, but the tail itself is a white basal portion and then distal or outermost is a dark half and it's a clean break between them. On a juvenile bald eagle, they typically are dark chested, dark bellied like the golden, but sometimes a little streaking, but they will show in the wing coverts, the axillaries and these greater and median and lesser coverts, a lot of white. And then the tail is quite mottled um, and it usually ends with a terminal dark band, but it can be much more extensive white, but it's not nearly as cleanly demarcated as on a golden eagle. So where the white is matters when you're looking at young eagles. Um, here's a look at a golden eagle showing that broad wing with that sort of bulge in the secondaries. But look at this extensive white and then pretty clean portion and patches of white, but no white in the wing linings, no white in the body. Uh, here's a dorsal view of a young golden eagle. And I just wanted to point out that sometimes you can see white from a ventral view on the base of the primaries and secondaries. Uh, but doesn't always show up in the dorsal view. But some golden eagles will show when they're soaring this white patch here at the basal portions of these flight feathers. And then again, the white is a pretty clean demarcation. And this picture reflects a little bit of the golden eagle's slight or moderate dihedral, the wingtips being slightly above the body when they soar. All right, so as the eagles start to mature, and I guess they could have started off with this, it takes about five years. It's in their fifth year that eagles develop their full mature adult plumage. And so we're talking about this progression from juvenile, juvenile meaning the first plumage they have. A juvenile is a bird that's leaving the nest and that they'll retain those feathers for one year. That's a juvenile plumage. But massive birds like eagles, it's very energy consumptive to grow those huge feathers. And so they don't molt all of their primary and secondary. They don't molt all of their flight feathers in one go. In fact, as they age, you'll have three generations of flight feathers on a wing. And so the trailing edge of an immature eagle often looks sawtoothed. And what you're seeing is on this bald eagle here, and you can say this is a bald eagle because it's got a lot of white in the wing lining, the coverts, but the trailing edge, juvenile, flight feathers of all raptors are typically quite pointed and a little bit longer. Uh, the thought being that a little bit longer gives them a little more surface, a little more um, for soaring, for, you know, for elevation, for soaring, for lift. That's what I'm trying to say, lift. They gain a little bit more lift by those extended feathers. 
and they're more pointed. And then once they're very capable flyers, but the adult feathers tend to be shorter and a little more blunt tipped. And so you're seeing retained juvenile feathers and then probably an adult, first adult or more mature next generation feather and so on on the trailing edge of this bald eagle's wing here. And same is true for this golden eagle. Here you've got some juvenile still plumage with a clean white basal portion, longer, more pointed tips, and then some growing in more adult-like feathers that are a little bit shorter and more blunt tipped. Two other things I wanted to point out about this golden eagle. Uh, notice the feathering coming down all the way to the feet. The tarsi are feathered. A bald eagle would have uh, naked tarsi. And look at this huge bulge in its chest. This golden eagle um, is taking off with probably two or three pounds of coyote in its crop. And so oftentimes you'll see a funky silhouette or a bulging chest on a bird of prey. And that just means it's recently had a large meal. Um, this is a roadside golden eagle that I happened to see and I was photographing it and then another big truck came by and it flushed the golden eagle and the raven. Um, but I got, was able to take this picture as it took off when the 18 wheeler went by. But again, I want to point out this, this is called a distended crop. It's just, it's full of coyote in there. All right, and so golden eagles basically, there's not a whole lot of progression because those bodies stay dark, but there's a conspicuous change with bald eagles. And that second and third plumage, some people refer to it as a white belly one, white belly two. Um, these are immature plumages, but you'll see a lot of white in the chest and belly starting to get a little bit yellow in the bill, yellow, sorry, white in the crown and more white in the tail. This is probably a two, three-year-old bald eagle, again, showing a golden eagle. You would not see all this extensive white on its back here, pointing that out. And as they age, the bill becomes more yellow and the eye color goes from dark to light. They get that bright, pale yellow eye as a full adult. And so this bird is probably in its third or fourth year, gaining some white in the head. And as it ages, obviously different individual, but less white modeling through here. And notice how the flight feathers, no more retained juvenile long pointy. So this bird is molted at least um, two more times since the juvenile plumage. And so these are all adult shaped feathers that are a little bit more blunt tipped and a little shorter. So more adult like wing and it's getting its white head probably in its third or fourth year. And this is that sort of traditional last plumage before they're a clean white adult head and tail. Oftentimes you'll see a black mask, but the bill is already bright golden yellow. All right, so we've taken care of the distinctive Northern Harrier, dealt with the big boys, the bald and the golden eagle. So now we're gonna get into the three other um, groups of hawks and falcons that we see. So we've got three to work through, the Budio, Excipiter, and Falco, or Falcons. Um, so the Budios, these are, on the left here is the red-tailed hawk, but these are stocky. These look like kegs to me. They're barrel-bodied bird, um, often perching and pouncing, fairly short-tailed. And notice the wingtips reach the tail tip on this red-tailed hawk. Structurally very different than this exhibitor here in the center. This is a sharp-shinned hawk, uh, narrow-bodied, long-tailed. And notice here the wings fall well short of the tail tip. These are short, compact, stocky, broad, but not long-winged birds. Um, these birds are open country, soaring, perching, and pouncing. Um, exhibitors are more typically in a forested landscape, though they certainly will be in a variety of habitats, um, also in migration. But more often found in forested landscapes, those short wings help them maneuver through the branches to chase their bird prey, primarily bird prey. Um, so exhibitors structurally very different, long-tailed short wings, and then the falcon, to me, falcons always look like a compressed V. If you see a perched falcon, um, they have very long, very pointed wings. And so look at this wing structure. These are the primaries here, reaching nearly the, the tail tip on this prairie falcon. So structurally, three different groups, so we're gonna work our way through them. Starting off the beauty of the B-52 bombers, as I mentioned. These are heavy body birds. They look like a keg. It's a barrel bodied bird. Um, and in the wintertime here in Colorado, we typically are dealing with 
three different species, the red-tailed hawk, ferruginous, and rough -like. uh, So red-tailed hawk is the classic roadside hawk. It's the, um, not roadside hawk species, but um, typically you see them perched roadsides. They're looking for small mammals in the ditches and open habitat and edge habitat. Uh, but Budio, it's barrel body, heavy bodied, stocky, uh, not exceptionally long. You can see the wings reach down to the tail of this end of this rufous tail. Uh, red tail hawk, what's distinctive about them when they're perched, often they present a belly band. They have a darker feather pattern of streaking across the middle section of the body. And notice the tarsi are naked. That's a good clue for the next two that we have here in Colorado in the winter because both have feathered tarsi. Um, so each tarsus is naked on this red tail, big beefy feet, heavy bodies, and obviously if you can see a rufous tail, that certainly helps. Rufous tailed hawk would be a more appropriate name in my mind. Um, and then from a dorsal view, that was a ventral view, from a dorsal view perch, even if you can't see if the tail is rufous or not, um, red tail hawks often have this V or U shaped tail coloration to a lot of the scapulars here on the back. And so if you see this horseshoe pattern of tail, it's not diagnostic, it's not eliminating everything else, but if I'm seeing a perch raptor and I see this tail U on the back, this horseshoe, that has me leaning towards red-tailed hawk. Uh, but here I just want to point out the fact that these are highly variable birds. Um, they're, they're very successful. I love red-tailed hawks. They're pretty amazing in that they occupy almost every habitat across the entire continent. Um, they're a widespread bird, uh, or even the islands of the Caribbean, the fact the scientific name Budio Jamaicanensis, and the nominate race is Budio Jamaicanensis, Jamaicanensis in Jamaica. Um, you know, they, they can survive and thrive in almost all sorts of landscapes, but things that unite them, typically if you see one perched, like this pale individual, but still sort of showing this belly band pattern, um, the naked tarsi is a good clue, but even here, this is an intermediate morph juvenile, and it's got heavier marking across the belly. Same thing, even this rufous morph bird. Um, and a good clue for aging raptors is eye color. Uh, in the center here, this is a, a juvenile intermediate morph, if you will, um, red-tailed hawk with that pale eye. As they get a little bit older, they start to get a rich brown and a very old bird tends to have almost a blackish brown eye. So three different ages by eye color. So that's a good clue sometimes too. If you're trying to figure out what it is, if you can figure out its age first, that can be quite helpful. But videos in general, most of the bird is above the perch. What I mean by that is if you see like here, there's not a whole lot below the feet. When they're perched, the tail is not particularly long. Most of the bird is above the branch, above, it, above the perch, and it's a keg-like shape. Uh, when they're in the flight, the things that distinctively make it a red tail besides its red tail, as I mentioned earlier, this patagial marker, patagium is dark. Um, and that's a really good clue for red-tailed hawks. They often show a wrist comma, but that's not distinctive. Um, and aging red-tailed hawks, or hawks in general, the subterminal tip to all the flight feathers is dark. And as we go forward, I'll show you some immatures that have much paler. So this subterminal band, the tips of the feathers are all pale, but just before the tip is this broad band. Um, and so that's a good clue for aging. Again, you have this belly band here. The patagiums are really a good clue. Um, noticeably different and sort of makes it difficult for people new to hawk watching or hawks in general is that red-tailed hawks do not acquire their rufous tail until they've molted out of their juvenile plumage. And so a red-tailed hawk leaving the nest has a brown banded tail, it is not rufous. Um, and it, just like the, with the eagles, as I mentioned earlier, juvenile plumage raptors have longer flight feathers. And so if you look at hawks a lot, you'll start to notice that the tails on young red-tailed hawks seem longer than on the adults and the flight feathers. But it's still showing a nice belly band. It's still showing the dark patagium and a wrist comma. Um, and then one more thing to point out, the trailing edge, remember this previous one here, look at the trailing edge of this adult versus the trailing edge of this juvenile is not nearly as conspicuous. And then in the primaries, red-tailed hawks in their juvenile plumage have a pale translucent 
sort of square shaped panel in those primaries. And a well lit bird often from below can look really big windows here. I'm going to go through some other, so I'll sort of point out the structural things. Nice broad bulging secondaries. Here's that rufous morph, uh, but again, showing some belly bands. And even in the rufous morph, there's a concentration of darker feathers in the patagium. And red tail hawks are, are highly variable. Um, they can come in dark morph as well as rufous. Um, there's also a subspecies in um, Alaska and Canada, northern reaches, it's called Harlands, uh, that doesn't even really show, can show a, a tail that is not even rufous, but here's sort of a classic Western um, rufous one. And, and I won't dig any deeper into red tail hawks because we could spend a whole night just talking about subspecies of red tail hawk. So I want to make sure I get through everybody here and, and still get you a chance to ask some questions. Um, and so here we have a red tailed hawk. And I just wanted to show this. This is a leucistic or bird exhibiting leucism. And so it's, it's not albinism in the sense of total absence of, plume, of pigmentation. Uh, but red tailed hawks, if you see a bird that's mauled white uh, in a very odd way, or almost entirely white or all white, it's probably a red-tailed hawk. They exhibit leucism pretty regularly compared to a lot of other birds. Um, we're going to use that red-tailed hawk to transition to our next video. This is, is uh, on the left here, a ferruginous hawk, and on the right, obviously, the red-tailed hawk. Uh, I want to point out is the structural differences between these two. This is a photograph um, that was um, shared with me from Steve Malodnow. He took this picture just a few days ago. Uh, at a prairie dog colony on the east side of Colorado somewhere. I can't remember where now. But ferruginous, look at how much bigger this bird is structurally, just really heavy bodied. It's like a, a baby eagle, if you will. The word ferruginous refers to rust colored or rust. Um, and so that's that really bright, rusty ferruginous here on all the wing linings. Um, the tail will show some ferruginous, some rust, but it also has white and silver sometimes, much more irregular compared to an adult red tailed hawk with a more consistently rufous tail. So I want to sort of show these two together and transition. Um, this photograph is not mine. This is from Mike Thompson in Montezuma County. He shared this one. This is a ferruginous hawk, a dark morph. They rarely come in dark morph. It's an uncommon morph. And um, I use the word morph as opposed to phase. Some people say a dark phase. Um, it has some historical significance that doesn't refer to time, but I find the word phase to be confusing to some people uh, because some people will think of this plumage as a time in the bird's life. And the plumage pattern, whether it's dark, light, intermediate, rufous, whatever, that does not change. A bird is born that way and it stays that way. Um, and so uh, this is a dark morph ferruginous hawk, but what stands out is it's a massive hawk. It's a big barrel-bodied, broad-chested hawk. Um, things that stand out about it, look at its um, bill here, a big heavy bill. It has a broad, a really broad, wide head, almost like an eagle, and the gape, which is sort of, if you think of a bird, if it had lips, um, the, the mouth lining here, this is called the gape. And for a ferruginous, it sneaks back all the way to mid-eye, or almost, almost sometimes projecting to the back of the eye. And it gives it sort of, I don't know, some people think of it as like it's smirking or it has a sinister look to it, but a really big head. And they have feathered tarsi, which you'll see in this next image here. So this is noticeably different than a uh, red tail hawk. Red tail hawk would have naked tarsi. They are feathered to the down to these massive feet. Ferruginous hawks love to eat prairie dogs. So they've got these massive feet to take care of prairie dogs. As this dark morph, we get another picture from Mike Thompson. Another birder in Montezuma County, Glenn Dunmire, shared this image with me. This is another dark morph that has a lot of rufous hints, but I wanted to share, again, look at structurally a massive hawk and look at the gape coming all the way back here to mid or almost back of the eye and very, really stands out. Uh, but most of the British hawks you're gonna come by are light morph. Here's one um, I just took the other day, a picture in Norwood here in San Miguel County. But again, look at how massive this bird is. Most of the birds above the perch, so we know it's a beauty of a big body, and then all this ferruginous, this coloration here. And it has some scaling across the breast, but it doesn't really coalesce into a belly band nearly as distinctly as red tails typically show. 
Uh, here's a more dorsal view of a Perugenus. Again, the, the gape coming back to the eye, conspicuous massive body, rufous highlights throughout, and then that kind of a rusty tail. This one looks not unlike a red-tailed hawk, um, but you could separate it by its more massive structure and that broad head, really broad head like an eagle, heavy bill and the gape coming back. Another quick example of another adult with lots of ferruginous, lots of rust throughout, broad headed. Uh, another picture shared with me from Steve Malotnow, same individual, just showing the really long winged, broad wings in the genus. They have a lot of pale in the base of the portion of the primaries, um, the base of the tail as well. Some, I forget, someone mentioned to me the other day, they referred to the three points of light. Um, you'll see here but really broad body. And they often kind of have a pinched hand. I'll point that out. Here's a, another picture from Steve Malad now, um, the long wing. And notice how here in the secondaries and then this outer portion of the wing is often referred to as the hand um, because this is the carpal joint. And so it reflects like our hand would be. And the hand often kind of tapers. It's a little bit, the wing is a little bit thinner through the hand than it is in the secondaries, the inner part of the wing. Uh, what's distinctive about Ferruginous hawks, they have some markings in the potassium like a red tail hawk, but it kind of continues through the coverts. It doesn't really jump out or it's not any darker here than it is in other places. Um, very little markings on this really broad, clean white chest. But in adult plumage, they always have rufous or ferruginous uh, leg feathers. So this thigh area, if you will, is quite rufous and that really jumps out or stands out against this vent and light undertail coverts. Um, even seen it on a snowy day flying away. You can still call this a ferruginous because structurally, big, broad chested hawk with dark wing, uh, otherwise light coloration and dark leggings. Um, when they're young, they don't have any of that ferruginous. They don't have any of the rust. And so you really have to lean on the structure of the bird, a massive bird. And like the golden eagle picture I shared earlier with the descended crop, this ferruginous hawk, this juvenile, as a descended crop, it just finished eating a prairie dog. Um, it's probably going off to digest it somewhere. Um, so that bulge in the chest refers to its descended crop, but massive heavy head, broad head. The remiges, the flight feathers are quite unmarked and um, throughout. And then you have that sort of three points of light, the pale basal portion of the primaries and the pale basal portions of the tail. So structurally, you can still say this is uh, the shape of the bird, the structure of the birds, stands out from a red tail. Another view of a young ferruginous focus on the big, broad chest, wide bodied, um, very clean, unmarked remiges. They'll show a risk common, but that's not necessarily diagnostic. But notice in the juvenile plumage, they lack the ferruginous leggings. And a dorsal view, again, broad, Oh, actually, I want to point that again here too. Here's a good example of that pinched hand look where the broad wings sort of get a little bit more narrow through the hand. And above the pale basal portion of the flight feathers and then the pale basal portion of the tail. This is important as we go into the next species, which has a similar pattern, but noticeable difference. So here's our third video we're going to talk about again. We know it's a beautiful because it's got this heavy body, most of the bird above the perch, but it's got really delicate feet and a really delicate bill. So structurally, this makes this bird, forget the plumage, this makes this bird a rough-legged hawk. Um, rough-legged hawk gets its name because it's Budio lacopus, the, the reference down here. Look at these rough or even shaggy leggings. And they have feathering all the way down to their tiny feet Tiny, when I say tiny, compared to a red tail or frugious, they have smaller feet, small bill, but they have feathering on the tarsi. And they show this carpal patch. Here's a adult male. But we'll get back into perch birds first, and then we'll talk about flight patterns. But um, for, for rough-legged hawk, um, small feet, small bill. And then uh, females and immatures have this dark, solid belly. Uh, highly variable, though. Um, they can be quite mottled, but uh, noticing a pattern here, they often look quite pale headed. If we go back to the adult male, we showed the first one perched. Uh, look at the pale head. 
a frosty head is a good, it's not diagnostic, but it, it, it gets you leaning. And with the adult males, they'll have some dark in the belly, but it's not solid dark. And they often will have a bibbed appearance compared to um, adult females like this one with a dark eye, like the red-tailed hawk. The eye starts pale and darkened. So this is an adult female. Another adult female and female because it's so dark throughout the whole area. It's not nearly as light as the adult males. And here she is landing on the next pole down. Um, and like the ferruginous hawk, it has a pale base to the tail, but there's not nearly as much pale in the basal portion of the primaries as the ferruginous hawk shows. I also will share this out of focus picture because look at how small these feet are proportionally. Feathered right down to the foot and small feet. Here's an adult male coming to a perch. The adult males tend to have less of a dark terminal band, more extensive white at the base of the tail and multiple tail bands. Uh, now we're getting into the birds in flight. Here's a young bird. So young birds like the adult females have a dark belly. Um, what stands out is they often have pretty clean wing linings. The secondary greater coverts and median coverts and lesser coverts tend to be quite buffy or quite pale. But all ferruginous hawks, oh, sorry, I'm mixing up my words here, all rough-legged hawks show a big conspicuous carpal patch. This wrist area is a big carpal patch here. And another way to tell it's a young bird, the trailing edge, that subterminal band is not bold. Oh, actually, one more thing I wanted to point out. Structurally, uh, rough-legged hawk, I think of as sort of a hybrid, if you will, between a if a northern harrier and a red-tailed hawk got together if you think of a you know if, if they had a kid if a northern harrier and a red-tailed hawk had a kid it would often i would think it would end up structurally like a, a rough-legged hawk because they have long wings they're broad like red tail but they're not as broad they're thinner than a red tail and they have a pretty clean trailing edge to the wing they don't have that secondary bulge that red tails often show so a little bit lankier proportions pale-headed, dark carpal patches, okay? Um, comparing that to this adult female, um, really dark carpal patch, tiny little bill. Um, so we know it's a roughly, and then but look at how dark these wing linings are. The, uh, the underwing coverts are quite modeled on the adult. Um, that, compare that to an adult male, what makes it a rough-legged hawk structurally? Right, so we know it's a Budio, long, broad wings, pretty straight trailing edge, big dark carpal patch. And unlike the females and immatures, he's darkest on his chest and a little bit paler on the belly. Most of the tail is white with multiple tail bands before the big broad subterminal band. So rough legged hawk just because of that tiny little bill and little feet. Um, and you can have a dark morph, rough legged hawks as well. The immatures and the female dark morphs tend to be quite brown and warm. And the carpal patches, even in this darker plumage, still stands out, but a pretty straight trailing edge. Um, and that contrasts with the adult male in the dark morph, but you can still tell this is a red, uh, sorry, rough-legged hawk because the trailing edge is fairly clean, fairly narrow-winged, more harrier-like than other budios. Tiny little bill, little feet, big, broad, subterminal band and multiple tail bands beyond. So that gets us through the budios. Uh, we're gonna move on to falcons. These are our little fighter jets, really angular um, in their body structure, very long, narrow pointed wings, you know, sort of sharp looking, if you will. Um, when they're perched, those long wings reach the end of the tail. Um, they have kind of a V shape when they're sitting there. Uh, their feet aren't nearly as powerful as the budios, so more delicate feet. Um, and we'll deal with four species here tonight. Uh, American casserole, the adult male. Don't need to say a whole lot about it. This is a pretty distinctive bird. This is our smallest falcon, and he's just gorgeous. Uh, that roof is in the back, buffy chest, um, blue in the wings. It's really striking. But look how long, elongated this bird is. Really long-tailed, really long wings. Um, and so it's just a very striking bird, but a more delicate feet. So just think about the structure of this as a falcon compared to the Budios we saw, which had a much more heavy body and not nearly as long tailed. 
Um, the adult females, similar, unlike the male which has the black spotting, she tends to have rufous or brown streaking on her breast. Um, her facial pattern is the same, but not quite as bold. And then her tail tends to be banded almost throughout. Here's a female found a metal bowl in Microtus pepsilvanicus, a big meal for a kestrel. Um, and in flights, falcons, long, narrow wings, very pointed, very long primaries, often showing a, a string of pearls. All the falcons typically have this kind of spotting before the tips of the flight feathers, and some people refer to that as a string of pearls. It kind of stands out. But uh, if you have decent light on an adult male kestrel, it's really quite distinctive with the blue wings, the rusty back, and the rusty tail. Oh, sorry, I should go back uh, to mention this picture was from uh, Tom Johnson, one of my colleagues at Field Guides, another tour leader for Field Guides. He shared this kestrel picture with me. Um, he also shared this picture, and this is a transitional picture for us as we work through falcons. Here we have a female American kestrel being harassed by the pugnacious merlin. They're in the same genus. They're quite similar in size, but kestrels tend to be a little longer, a little more angular, a little bit thinner wings, sickle-shaped wings, a little bit longer tailed. Uh, Merlin's gonna be a little bit chunkier, heavy body, a little more compact, more robust in shape, and a whole lot more attitude. Um, they just are sort of, they've got, they're just pugnacious. Um, here's one perched. The uh, females immatures are kind of dark brownish backs. They have a subtle facial pattern, minimal malar stripe. The falcons have very rounded heads, but look at this V shape. You know, that alone, if you just made a silhouette, had no coloration, you could be calling this a falcon because it's got this sort of V shape and the wingtip. Um, they are slightly sexually dimorphic by plumage, the adult males. Um, end up with this bluish coloration. Some people refer to them as blue jacks. Uh, this beautiful male, though, has got a lot of blue here throughout these wing coverts and the scapulars and mantle. And Merlins tend to show a pale supercilium, but they're much more streaky, much darker in general than kestrels. Um, not much bigger overall, but just much heavier body. Here's another one that's a, looks like a youngster or female type. Um, long wings reaching down to a long tail but really dark compared to a kestrel and subtle head pattern. Kestrels having a much more distinctive head pattern. All right, here's a Merlin in flight, like the kestrel, like all falcons, long, thin, narrow wings, coming to a significant point, pretty uniform throughout, not nearly as much contrast as the kestrel would show. And then tail banding. Merlins have distinctive thin white tail bands on this dorsal view, and here again, the supercilium. Um, this that previous picture and this picture are both from Doug Gotchville, another friend and colleague at Field Guides, another tour leader, Doug Gotchville, shared these Merlin pictures. He lives in, in New York City, um, and so he birds all those barrier islands in New York and gets lots of falcons migrating, so he shared these great pictures with me. But again, small falcon, long, thin, narrow wing, so structurally similar to a kestrel, but just chunkier, heavier bodied. And look how dark this wing lining is and just really streaky below. Showing a supercilium, minimal mustachial mark. And we can still, even in a folded tail, still pick up those white tail bands. Um, here we go with a bigger, much bigger falcon. This is a prairie falcon, but still getting it right to falcon by this V shape. Kind of broad shouldered tapering down, long pointed primaries reaching nearly the tail tip. Prairie falcons are brown above, lighter below, and they have a weak mustachial mark. This is a youngster uh, because the sear, the spatial skin here above the bill, is quite pale. Um, contrast that with its similar size and structure, uh, close cousin, the peregrine falcon but it has a much more hooded or helmeted appearance with a much thicker, darker uh, mustachial area here. Uh, not nearly as thin as the prairie falcon shows. And then when you put them in the air, the key difference is they're structurally quite similar. Long, thin, narrow wings, long hands, really long-handed, very long primaries. This prairie falcon happens to be molting its inner primaries and outer secondaries, so the trailing edge is a little funky on this bird. Big difference though, checkered but usually patterned 
under a wing, wing lining on a peregrine falcon here on the right. Notice the prairie falcon, dark, uniformly dark axillaries, these wing pits, if you will, extending out into the underwing coverts, dark wing pits. And so, so this blackish area here is really, that's a good diagnostic field mark for prairie falcon. A weak mustachial mark compared to this sort of fully dark hooded helmeted look on the peregrine. They get a little trickier. I don't know how I must have. I don't know how I did this blue here. I'm not sure if people have seen these blue marks here. I'm not sure how I managed to do that, but try and ignore them. Here's another picture from Doug Gottschfeld. Um, this is a young peregrine, and this can be tricky with a prairie falcon because they're brown. They don't get that blue, slaty blue gray of the adults. Um, it has the weaker mustachial mark, but it tends to be heavier. Also tends to be paler on the crown. And the key mark, though, is on the underside. It will lack. Here's a prairie falcon with this, even in a juvenile plumage, um, still is going to have those really dark axillaries and dark wing linings. All right. Um, and now we're going to wrap up with exhibitors. So, say the uh, most, maybe in some ways, most challenging group for the last. Uh, I like to refer to them as the forest phantoms. They kind of, they're um, ambush predators. They kind of, you know, hide in a secretive perch and then rapidly pursue mostly um, bird prey. There are hawks that eat other birds. Though as you get bigger, the sharp chin hawk, the smallest, that's pretty exclusively a bird diet. Cooper's hawk, especially the females, which are larger, will um, get into some mammal eating like chipmunks and such. And then northern goshawk, uh, the biggest one by far, um, they will definitely get into eating mammals like um, squirrels and, and rabbits as well as birds. But um, what is uniform throughout this genus, uh, is it's short, stocky wings and long tails. Um, they're very good for rapid, quick pursuits, maneuverability through the forested landscapes. All right, uh, we're gonna deal with the big guy um, right away. This is a picture from Tom Johnson. Again, I mentioned the field guides tour leader, friend of mine. Uh, he lives in Cape May, New Jersey, which sees lots of exhibitors migrating in the fall. And he shared this picture with me. Um, and I just wanna start off by saying, I really like the expression, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, okay? Um, and basically what that's trying to say is northern goshawks are uncommon. They're not, um, you know, endangered. They're, they're a widespread species, but they're just never numerous anywhere. You just don't come across northern goshawks very often. Some people have better luck than others, but for the most part, if you're looking at a big exhibitor, in my mind, it's a Cooper's hawk until proven otherwise. And what proves this bird otherwise are some key features here. Uh, a northern goshawk is very heavy bodied, sort of almost bellied, if you will. It's sort of like a submarine bellied bird. So a bigger, bellier bird. Um, it often shows a, all three exhibitors in their immature plumage can show a light supercilium like this northern goshawk does, but it tends to be flared or most conspicuous on northern goshawks. And then the wing structure, bulging secondaries and a little bit more of a pinched hand. And they're very heavily marked in this first immature plumage. Lots of streaking and that streaking continues all the way down into the undertail coverts. Here's another angle, again, focusing what makes this a northern goshawk immature and not say a Cooper's hawk is the really blotchy, thick. Well, I'm not sure how I'm doing that, I'm sorry. If anyone, uh, if one of the other hosts has a, wants to chime in here and tell me how to get rid of the blue, I'm not sure how I'm adding that. Um, I apologize. Um, but what we're looking at here is bulging secondaries, pinched hand, and then streaking down through the undertail coverts. Um, here's another different individual. This one was shared by Deb Turbidy, um, who was in Mesa County, a birder, shared this Northern Goshawk picture with me. They have, oftentimes they look kind of, they're so big bodied that they often look small headed. A light supercilium, really heavy streaking um, underneath the undertail coverts and um, bulging secondaries. You can see these, these bulging secondaries and then a pinched hand look. So the trailing edge is going to be lots of streaking throughout here. Um, and then smaller headed and really long tailed. 
Here's a, another picture from Tom Johnson. This is a dorsal view of a northern goshawk. And I'm going to focus on the tail for these. So heavy body, light supercilium. Um, they often show some pale sort of carpal bars here, these like tawny pale coverts through this middle part of the wing. But the tail pattern on a northern goshawk, like other exhibitors, is broad pale bands, broad dark bands. But on a northern goshawk, what's distinctive is they tend to look wavy line. These bars on the tail don't match up very evenly. It kind of looks wavy. And the dark bars, if you can see carefully here, the dark bars have uh, white highlights. There's often a bright, white, thin highlight bordering the dark bands, separating the dark bands from the pale bands on the tail and those wavy bands. That's a good thing to look for on northern goshawks. If you get an adult even far away, even a lousy photo like this one of mine, um, they're just quite distinctive. It's, a, it's an exhibitor straight away because the wings are quite blocky. Short, broad wings, um, you know, broad-handed bird. But look at that tail length is as long as the body is. Um, so long-tailed. And then the adults with that pale gray plumage and that black mask, it's really quite distinctive if you get an adult. All right, so we're going to finish up here <coughs> with, the, with the Schupers the sharp shinned hawk and the coopers. This is oftentimes the most challenging ID that we are faced with. Um, and oftentimes we get good looks and we still have to simply say unidentified. But like all the hawks I've talked about tonight and birding in general, um, what you want to do is instead of focusing on one particular characteristic, the key to a successful identification is looking at the totality of the field marks that are presented. So take as much information as you can and there's a whole list of field marks I'll go over. And you don't want to focus on any one, but see if you can add as many as you can all together to come up with your identification. Um, and sometimes you just have to say, let it go. Because keep in mind, females are larger than males. And so, and sharp shins are smaller than Cooper's hawk. So a sharp shinned female is almost, but not quite as big as a male Cooper's hawk. And that's really where you get in trouble with identification. A big female Cooper's hawk never really makes you think Sharpie. And a dainty little delicate male sharp shinned hawk never really makes you question Cooper's. It's those Choopers, those ones in between, the female sharp shins and the male Cooper's. Um, the great Cleveland Arthur Bent series um, talked about behavior in a lot of great ways. And he talked about in flight how a sharp shin looks buoyant or fluttery compared to a Cooper's hawk in flight often looks powerful and direct in their flight style. But uh, looking at these two adults on the left here, you've got a hawk that has, as the foot gives way to the tarsi, thin tarsi. You've got a fairly small rounded head and it looks like the eye is pretty centrally located and that eye looks big. It kind of has a bug-eyed appearance on a rounded head. And then I'm looking down here at the tip of the tail, and most of the tail feathers are pretty uniform in length, and the white terminal band is quite thin. This adds up to a sharp shin hawk. Compare that to this Cooper's hawk here. Looks kind of smaller eyed. The eye doesn't look nearly as big in the head as the sharp shin does. Um, it has more of a capped appearance. Um, a little flatter. This is the top angle to judge the head shape, but look at that smaller eyes. And then if I look down here, you can't see the tar side to evaluate those, but I'm looking at the tail and the underside of the tail here. Notice this feather and this feather are noticeably, conspicuously shorter than this longest one um, on a folded tail. So if you think of a bird soaring with its tail fanned out, the outermost tail feathers, when a bird is perched and claps, are the ones that end up underneath so to speak. So this is actually the outermost tail feather. And the central tail feathers, when the bird perches, end up sort of the, what are called the deck feathers. If you're looking at it from behind or dorsally, the tail feathers that you see are the central ones. And the outermost tail feathers are the ones that are tucked underneath. And here on a Cooper's hawk, these outermost ones are much shorter, conspicuously shorter, compared to the sharp chin. And then the terminal white tail bands is noticeably wider. To me, it's like a pencil line 
versus a marker was painted on here. All right, another comparison. We're going to focus on here. Again, the sharp shinned hawk is on the left, the Cooper's hawk is on the right. Um, starting at the top of the bird, uh, sharp shinned often look pea headed. They have a very rounded and what appears to be a small head. They appear large eyed, and the eye appears to be centrally located within that rounded head. I'm coming down to the bill. Uh, and now, if we're looking here at this Cooper's hawk, the eye, it's kind of hard to make out this individual, but the eye looks closer to the bill than the middle of the head. And notice the nape on a Cooper's hawk. It's quite flared. This is often the case on a perched Cooper's hawk. They often flare their nape, giving a blocky, broad headed appearance. They often have a very flat headed appearance as well, compared to this relaxed feathering here on the nape of a sharp shin, giving a more rounded head appearance and not nearly as flat headed. So that flare nape, that's a good, all of that does not mean for young birds or adults, that's for all plumages. You have that flared um, nape. Um, as you go down the bird, looking on it here, let's get to the other end now. Graduated tail feathers, so the innermost, sorry, the outermost tail feathers, which present on the inside on a perch bird when the tail is collapsed. This is conspicuously shorter than these longest feathers. Compared to the sharp shinned hawk, where these feathers look fairly uniform in length. Also, look at the tip of the tail, very thin white line, much broader, more extensive white. And of course, this can wear on a Cooper's hawk. Um, so, could a Cooper's hawk with a worn tail show a thinner white line like a sharp shin? Yes, um, but a sharp shin can never show wider than, could never be the other way around. But again, the head shape structure of the head, um, and then the tail graduation and the terminal tail band is what's presented here in these photos. Um, it's the same sharp and it just turns its head around. What I want to point out in this one, again, confirming or reinforcing the tail feathering is pretty much uniform in length. It's only slightly variable, minimal white tail band. And then this is how they got their name, sharp shinned hawks. Um, so early ornithologists, when they're naming birds, lying dead on a museum tray, a specimen, if you look at the legs of a sharp shin compared to a Cooper's, they're spindly. They're much thinner, um, not nearly as stout. Um, so this is uh, much thinner and they're sort of a little bit laterally compressed. They almost looks like linguine versus um, a straw on a Cooper's hawk. And then another thing I want to point out is the coloration of grayish blue on the adult sharp shin on the crown, the nape, and the mantle is quite uniform. On a Cooper's hawk, if this is a Cooper's hawk, it would have a darker cap and a paler nape. Here we go, the Cooper's hawk, much flatter headed and has a capped appearance. The dark coloration tends to be restricted to the cap. You can't quite see the nape, but you can kind of tell it does not continue dark here. A little meaner, broader headed look. The eye doesn't look as large and the tail is more graduated. Here's one tail feather compared to the terminal tip of this one here. Okay, and this holds true for the juvenile plumages. So I was showing you adult plumages with a slate blue gray back and that red barring. And I'll just to keep it consistent, I'll keep the sharp shinned on the left and the Cooper's hawk on the right. Okay, same structural things come into play. Spindly legs here on the sharp shinned hawk. Terminal white tail band is much thinner. Tail feathers look fairly uniform in length. All right, kind of a pea-headed appearance. The eye looks centrally located within the head. On a Cooper's hawk, check out this flared nape, given a very broad-headed appearance, making the eye look much closer to the bill on the sharp chin. Like I said, a Cooper's hawk can certainly relax these feathers, and then it gets challenging. But if I see a flared nape, that's a pretty good tip-off for Cooper's hawk. It's got me leaning that way. But flatter-headed, kind of going right into the bill, as opposed to the steeper forehead, more abrupt, rounded head shape of a sharp shin. The streaking, it's hard to compare, but the streaking on a young sharp shin tends to be blotchier, a little thicker. On a Cooper's, it goes from really heavy dark and then kind of comes, becomes much thinner here towards the base. All right, so having said all of that, I'll just let you look at this one for a second before I mention it, but 
look at the top and the bottom of this bird. Starting at the top, a broad, flat-headed look to it. Um, the kind of the forehead coming right into the bill. The eye looks not terribly large, looks closer to the bill than to the back of the head. The streaking on the breast is thin and tapers out the, to the vent here, and essentially is absent. The tail feathers, the outermost tail feathers, are conspicuously shorter than the central ones. This is an immature Cooper's hawk. All right, contrast that with this bird here, pea-headed, small-headed, round-headed, okay? And the tail feathers, the outermost tail feathers are only slightly shorter than the central ones. This is a young or immature sharp shinned hawk. Um, same individual, this individual here, the sharp shinned hawk, here's a dorsal view of the same bird. An occipiter, because the wingtips fall well short of the tail tip. Um, oh, and here's a good, I mentioned earlier the, the Cooper's hawk, uh, sorry, the Northern goshawk having those wavy bands. These are more consistent, lack the white highlights. And then look at the outermost tail feathers compared to the central ones and has a very pea headed appearance to it. So sharp shin talk. Uh, another example of sharp shin. Um, this one's showing a fairly broad white terminal band. So you might think, start thinking Cooper's, but boy, even the other feathers are all about the same length. And it looks quite stocky and, and nicely round headed with a centrally located large bug eyed appearance. So sharp shinned hawk here. Um, so those are perched views of exhibitors and we're gonna finish up. I know it's gone quite a while. Hopefully people are still paying attention um, or interested. We're gonna finish with sharp shin versus Cooper's in flight. Um, think of a Cooper's hawk as a flying cross. Um, they have those short rocky wings, but they have a fairly long neck and head. So there's quite a bit projecting in front of the wing and very long tail. This Cooper's hawk has got a avian prey. I can't remember what it was that it was eating. That it flew over. Um, I like to share this photo too because Cooper's hawks, the undertail coverts are, are white on both the sharp shins and the Coopers on the adult plumage. But for Cooper's hawks, they often show kind of flare out. So if you see kind of a bushy, cottony look to the undertail covert, that gets me leaning towards Cooper's, but a lot of bird in front of the wing. Contrast that with the sharp shin talk. P headed. They often thrust these carpal joints a little bit forward. And so you've got a little bit more, so you have very little projection of head in front of the wings. This pea headed look, and then look at this tail, nice sharp corners here. It's not rounded. These outermost tail feathers are pretty much uniform in length. Um, and now here to come directly compare them, these are both here in adult plumages, as I did earlier. I've got the sharp shinned hawk on the left. Cooper's hawk on the right. And what I want to point out here, small headed appearance, these wrists, these carpal joints thrust forward. And so they often have this kind of crooked leading edge to the wing, making the head look sunken in and not projecting very far. Um, and, and as compared to a Cooper's, they often will soar with a very straight leading edge swing. It's not diagnostic, but again, you have to take a totality of the clues that are given. But if I'm seeing an exhibitor that's got the sort of the head tucked in and the glider sore with the carpal joints thrust forward quite a bit, gets me leaning towards sharp shins, but then I'm gonna watch its flight style. Is it buoyant and fluttery? Sharp shins compared to the strong, steady, powerful flight of a Cooper's hawk, often soaring with a straight leaning edge to the wing. And then look at these outermost tail feathers are noticeably shorter than the central ones. All right, I hope I haven't overwhelmed everyone too much, but uh, that concludes um, what I wanted to share with you tonight. And so um, this is, uh, you can catch up to me. So we'll have a question and answer if anyone wants to stick around and ask some specific questions, um, they're welcome to do so. Um, but if you have something that occurs to you tonight after you've just logged off and you want to email me, I'm eric at foxkinandbirding.com. You can find me and I'll, uh, um, I don't know if I should stop sharing screens. Let's see what the hosts want to do. But if anyone has any questions that want to share with me, I'm I'm open to that. That was great, Eric. Um, this is Nick again. Uh, I think what we could do is, if you're willing to take some questions, if people want to type their questions into the chat box, or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you, and you can unmute yourself and ask the question. 
And I'll so stop share so we can, people can see each other for at least. You know, the, the raise your hand yeah. function down at the bottom. Let's see, does it, does it, does it work? It's... So the one question that came up in the chat box was from Fran, uh, not necessarily related to the talk, but can she volunteer for a hawk watch with you? With, with me personally? Was that, was that the question? I believe so. Um, certainly, I mean, there are, I'm not in a major migration area, so most of the hawk watch sites are on geographic funneling points like coasts or mountain ridges, mountain lines. The, the classic one, like where I was at Hawk Mountain, is the Kittatinny Ridge uh, on the west coast, the east coast, um, front range of the Rockies. Here in the San Juans where I am, um, we don't really have any major geographic funneling points to get a big concentration. Um, so um, hawk watching with me here is not really um, an option. There's lots of raptors around, but it's not really like you're going to have access to a sort of a, a migration phenomenon here. I, so I'm not I sure if I addressed that question or not. But I think she's interested in, in, in any hawk watch, and there's one at Dinosaur Ridge. Uh -huh. Does anybody know how to contact the organizers of the Dinosaur Ridge Hawk Watch? I would recommend um, Hamana, uh, the Hawk Migration Association of North America. If you just go onto Hamana's website, you know, it's hmana.org, I believe. Um, and they have a whole, they, they geographically list all of the Hawk Watches all across North America. So you can find whatever one is closest to you by going to their website. You. You could call uh, David Hill. Um, I'm organizing the Hawk Watch at uh, Dinosaur Ridge. We're having a general meeting uh, towards the end of the month, and uh, I'll pass information out. My, e my email is davidhill2357 at gmail.com. Okay, Deborah Kat Carstensen has a question. Uh, so yes. I, uh, I know that um, the gray ghost, what's his name, has the super cilium, but I saw that you put a juvenile Coopers, I believe, also had that white super cilium. I wondered how many of the uh, occipiters have that and how that can confuse me. Gotcha. Uh, um, yeah, so for immature exhibitors, whether it's Sharp Talk, Cooper's Hawk, or Northern Goshawk, all three will show a light supercilium. Okay. Um, that, does not, that does not distinctly separate them. But um, essentially, as you get bigger, it gets more conspicuous, is how I think of it. Sharp often show a very faint supercilium or inconspicuous. Cooper's Hawks will show a light supercilium, but Sometimes it's a little bit bolder, but it's it's there, but not really bold. Um, and the northern goshawk, the largest one, tends to have the most conspicuous, most flared, most obvious light supercilium. But there's not there's such a degree of overlap that you would not identify one versus the other by the presence or absence of it. It's just one of the clues you put together. So if I saw a really big exhibitor that had a really big supercilium, you know that might be I mean, that'd be a get me leaning in, towards Northern Gossock, but it does not eliminate the fact that Cooper socks can also show that. Okay, thank you. Sure, great question. Okay, we had a question as far as, um, did they miss red-shouldered hawk information or are they not present in Colorado? As well as uh, red-shouldered hawk or wait. Um, Broadwing talks was the other. Probably, I got you. Yeah, so the focus, I mean, I went on for well over an hour. Um, I was delighted to see people stuck around, but I was just trying to um, limit the scope of the, the lecture. And so I chose to focus on raptors that you can see on a regular basis in the winter in Colorado. Um, and so red shoulder hawks were a bit out of their range in general, but also broadwing hawks are long distance migrants. And so the ones that do show up in Colorado or typically here just during the breeding season and then spring and fall migration. So 
um, we would not be seeing them this time of year here. So I, I, not to say they couldn't be in Colorado, just not this likely this time of year. Another interesting question was, are all of these raptors year round residents? Ah, that's a great question. Um, most raptor species are migratory, um, but also there's a lot of overlap. Um, when you talk about birds, you talk about um, complete migrants, you know, like a rough-legged hawk. Um, they breed up at the edge of the taiga and under the tundra, and so they're an extremely northern breeding raptor. And so their breeding range is entirely separate from their wintering range. So for example, a rough-legged hawk, we only see them here in the wintertime. This is where they, they come south. This is their southern end of their migration. Um, in the springtime, they will depart, you know, mostly heading out in March. Some will linger into April. And as they go back up to the Arctic, um, Swainson's hawks will arrive. And so I, that's another rapture that occurs commonly in Colorado, but I chose not to include because they're not here in the wintertime. Um, whereas red tail hawks, some of them are resonant in, on their territory throughout the year. Some of them come to Colorado and migrate. So it's hard to look at some species and know if they have um, are resonant versus migrants, like golden eagles, for example. We have golden eagles year round in Colorado. There are some residents, but we also have some birds that may have migrated here for the winter from as far away as say Alaska. Okay, the next question came from Maureen. She says, I noticed white dot feathers on the back of Cooper's hawks. And you mentioned string of pearls on Northern goshawks. Are the white light dot feathers on the back of the Cooper's hawks the same as on the Northern goshawks? Hmm. Um, great question. All three immature exhibitors will show some white modeling on those upper wing coverts. And so it's not diagnostic for one or the other, though often, the northern goshawk immature will have a more concentrated or more conspicuous tawny bar across those coverts. So I mentioned it because it's a it's an indicator, but it is by no means uh, you can't draw a line in the sand based on those alone. All three immature exhibitors will show some white modeling in those coverts. Nice, that was interesting. I didn't even know that. Um, what is the best strategy for IDing perched raptors that are far off and appear all dark? <laughs> Tough ones. <laughs> get, get closer. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, no, but in a serious question. So if you're seeing an all dark raptor, you're either dealing with a dark morph studio or you're dealing with an eagle. Um, and so even a long ways away, an eagle still is gonna show a really massive head and a heavy bill. Um, so first trying to separate, are you looking at an eagle versus a dark morph bootio? Um, and if you are, you know, I was looking at a rough legged dark morph the other day, and uh, I just couldn't even see the bill. Um, even a far away, even in a scope, it was just looking small headed. Um, so looking at structure is probably your best clue if you can't get closer. I have a question for you. I noticed in your your comparison shot of the the, the male sharpshin hawk with the, uh, the male cooper's hawk with the female cooper's hawk, that the female cooper's hawk looked like it had a more rounded tail than the male one. Is that is that true? I don't know of um, a gender difference in terms of tail feather length. Um, that's probably more related to um, molt timing or wear. If there was a noticeable difference between the and that pair on the, on the same branch. If the tail shape was a little bit different, that's, I would say I attribute that more to wear or to molt timing than I would to gender specific. Okay. Deborah Carstensen, another question? Deborah? I think she needs to be unmuted. I, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't mean to raise my hand. Oh, okay. Sorry, it came up on my phone again. Oh, okay. Any more questions out there? I think there's a couple more in the chat. Um, from Jesse, we have, which of the raptors per body weight can carry the greatest prey weight-wise? Oh, yeah, well, okay. I, I mean, the bigger the bird, the, the bigger the prey. So I would obviously eagles would be the answer to that question. The eagles can certainly carry something much larger. You know, like a golden eagle can easily pick up a jackrabbit um, and fly off with it. 
Um, but there's also a lot of variation among individuals. As I mentioned, the sexual dimorphism. I spent a lot of time in Virginia banding raptors in fall migration. And um, on more than one occasion, we, we trapped uh, multiple red tails at the same time. And at one point, I have a photo of an old slide, which doesn't do well for digital. But uh, we had a male red-tailed hawk in the blind that weighed uh, 700 and some grams. And we then abruptly caught a female that weighed over 1,450 grams. She was literally more than double his size. Um, and so it just depends on the girth of the bird and, and the gender. But in general, I would say, you could say females are more powerful than males. Um, and then eagles are more powerful than hawks. Eric? Yes. If I understood the court question correctly, I would have to argue it's the great horned owl. If you consider the great horned owl a raptor, or a bird of prey, because the question said in proportion to the raptor's weight. So who gets the biggest prey in relationship to their size? And I've always heard is okay. great horned owl. Uh, if it's in terms of picking up and carrying that, that's certainly a good argument. Yeah, I was sort of limiting it to diurnal raptors. Owls are absolutely raptors. They are birds of prey. Um, if we're talking about picking up and carrying it, I don't, I'm not sure anyone's actually done the, the numbers on that. Um, in terms of the largest kill, if it was simply what, what's most powerful, there are documented cases of golden eagles um, dispatching bighorn sheep. Um, and of course, you'd be like, that's impossible in no a way. Well, what they do is there are some cases, some eagles have learned when sheep are in very precarious ledges, they dive on them and harass them and cause the sheep to fall. And eagles, both golden and bald, are very happy to be scavengers of carcasses. And so there are documented cases of golden eagles harassing bighorn sheep and causing them to fall to their death. Um, you know, when a bighorn sheep, a ram could be a couple hundred pounds. So um, I don't think I could give a great horn owl credit for that. So I, I'd go golden eagle, but I hear what you're saying about in terms of lift off. And I, I, I don't have the numbers on that. Do you know if male jur falcons can overlap in size with female prairie falcons? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I don't think um, weight-wise, I would be surprised if that's true. Um, to, to look at a perch bird, I would think they probably, a male deer falcon could, could look similar size, appear similar size to a female prairie falcon. But I would be doubtful that, that uh, it would ever waste that little. So it's still, deer falcons just look more robust, um, you yeah. know, so. The, bird, the, the best, best, best way by far for telling the deer falcon is, is there a large falcon, obviously, but size is a good, good deceiver, but they're long tailed. Um, and so prairie falcons and peregrines, both their wingtips nearly reach their tail tip. On a deer falcon, the wingtips fall well shy of the tip of the tail. It's not exhibitor, Ask, but it's mm -hmm. it's noticeably short of the tail tip, and so that's the that's the best way to separate a deer falcon. The one that's that's been hanging around Larimer County for the last three years is is quite small. Mm. Yeah, likely male. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Casey had a question uh, that you actually kind of answered already. Um, if owls are birds of prey, raptors, or something else, which you did mention, they are absolutely birds of prey. They absolutely count in the category of raptors. So for the last question, I will go to Andrew's question, which is more of a physiology question. So uh, challenge question, I guess, what we'll call it. Um, can you talk about how raptors can see so well up close when they have also incredible farsight? That is a very interesting question, and I don't have the answer for that. I don't, uh, I'm not an expert in that regard, so I, I don't know, like, how can they see their feet and also see three miles away? Yeah, I, I don't know the, the physiology of the, the structure of the eye to, that, that makes that happen, but they are, their vision is exceptional, but I don't know why that, why I can still see close. Yeah, so, I, I have no idea. It's a really interesting physiology question. I might have to do some Googling after yeah. this. Claire Mix had a question and I, I uh, authorized her to share her screen so she can show yeah. her picture. I was gonna say, Claire. Yeah, can you, uh, can oh. you see it now? 
Cleveland. Yes, we can see your, well, no, we, uh, I can see your face. I can't see your screen yet. I, we have to give you uh, per, uh, I, per, I believe. I, I did that. I'll, I'll just ask, I'll ask you the question. Um, okay, so when we're talking about light, light morph, ferruginous versus red tails and they often have like the same color on their head and say if you can mm -hmm. only see their head like if they're perched what do you do like where do you, where do you go for me it's all about i start with structure um a, a, a ferruginous is always going to look like a red tail on steroids they're just noticeably beefier and and heavier they're just like a keg a barrel body they're really broad chested um, and if you're looking at the head, the head is much wider. It's a much broader eagle-like head. Um, and if you're looking at a perch bird, if you have, if it's holding still for you, if you can get a good optics on it, look at the tarsi. Ferruginous, no matter what morph it is, will always have feathered tarsi and red tails. Now, of course, when they're relaxed on a perch, they kind of sink down and bend their legs and you can't see the tarsi. But, but that is, no matter what age or what plumage, um, whether it's dark or light or juvenile or adult, it's always going to have a feathered tarsus, tarsi. It, it doesn't have to be a rufous color on the light morph, correct? For the ferruginous? Correct. Okay, thank you. Sure. And with that, uh, there are no more questions in the chat. There are a lot of um, appreciation for your presentation and all the information that we gained and the beautiful pictures. So thank you so much again for hosting um, this presentation for a large group of people. I think we had a maximum of 213 folks that wanted to do this for their Sunday night. So there's a few applause going out in the, uh, in the viewers. So thank you so very much again. It was wonderful. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity to to share something that I'm very passionate about. And I, I hope to, in, in healthier times, get to meet or see all of you again. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very, very much all. And I'm, 